I'm Thomas Moore. I am the author of Care of the Soul, which was a book that came out in 1992 and is still uh, selling and people are still reading and I still get messages from people in various parts of the world. So that's very satisfying to me. Um, and since then, I have uh, published uh, about 30 more books, most of them about soul and uh, spirit and, uh, and other related things. So what I'd like to do now is talk to you about you know, this idea of soul and spirit and uh, and expand on it from what you may have found in my book. Sometimes I know that if you can hear an author talk about a subject, uh, you pick up uh, you pick up ideas that you wouldn't necessarily find in the book itself. So the first thing I want to say about uh, the soul is, the idea of soul is that the, that this word is very ancient, very old. Um, I didn't make this up. Uh, and I know that uh, in the past number of years, uh, people have used the word soul a, a lot. Even in advertising, you see the word soul quite often. And in headlines of uh, news, you see the word soul. But I take it from uh, the ancient past from long ago, Plato wrote a great deal about the soul, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher. And another philosopher, Aristotle, also wrote about the soul. Um, he said something interesting about it. He said that every part of your body has its own soul. I think that's such an interesting idea, that every part of our body has its own consciousness, you might say, its own personality. And I think this applies to when we get sick, if we could realize that wherever we are sick. For example, uh, this past week, I had a melanoma, a cancer on my arm and had uh, surgery on it. And my arm then became the focus of my, of my life, of my life narrative, my left arm. And I had to think about it and think about what it has done for me over the years. And I think you can have that relationship to the parts of your body. Soul, the idea of soul, first of all, gives you a sense of relating. You can relate to something that has soul. I think that's really a key uh, aspect of soul. So I can have a relationship to a, a body part. Um, I can feel it as being me. On the other hand, I can also talk to it. And, and feel about it as something apart from me. That's really a basic idea about soul. In fact, I would say that about the soul itself, that the soul is me in a way. It's like you talk about my soul, it's how deep you experience something. You experience at the level of your soul, it's very, very deep. It goes beyond emotions really to, to your very essence. And yet at the same time, you can experience your soul as something other, other than you. Uh, my soul might feel something. And you say that, my soul, as though it's something else. And I think this is very interesting. It's, uh, it's not a contradiction to be resolved just the way things are, that, uh, that we have a soul that is me and is not me at the same time. And so when I talk about care of the soul, I'm, I'm talking about, in s to some extent, about care of your soul, but about the soul in general in a big way. And what does that mean then, care of the soul? Uh, notice the word care, because this is very important, care. So when I use the phrase care of the soul, what I mean is daily attention to your soul. And what that would mean would be things like, make sure that you have a sense of home, because home is very important to the soul. You see, the soul is intimate. It's part of life. And this is, I'm, I guess I'm getting to this point now, to distinguish the soul from spirit. The way I uh, talk about soul, which is very much in the traditions of the ancient writers, is that the soul is part of our 
very intimate life. It's the soul is embedded in our lives. So the, the things that are important to the soul are very simple, like home. Home, having a feeling for home is very important. Now, your house may give that to you, and it may not. You may be living in a house that doesn't give you a sense that you're at home, and you might want to move because of that. But the main thing is that what we need is that sense of being at home. There's a comfort there. There's a sense of location, of knowing where you are, of being in the right place. All of that is very important to the soul. It gives you that foundation, you know, being there, being present in your life. That is so important to the soul. And one of the words we associate with soul frequently is deep. So to have a deep sense of home. It's more about depth. Soul is more about depth than height. Uh, spirit tends to be high, and the soul tends to be deep. So uh, being, to, being able to develop your life in a way that it has depth, and it has these basic necessities that are very close to the heart, like home. Related to home would be family, of course. You know, if you have family members, they're in a marriage, if you have children, how important they are to your soul, what, the, the, you know, who you relate to, who are who, the people who are important to you, that's part of the soul as well. So care of the soul can be very concrete sometimes. You want to take care of your house. You want to have a house that people enjoy living in, uh, a house in which a family can grow up, where children can feel uh, comforted and protected and have their experiences of childhood. All of that is so important to the soul. When I mention childhood, I'm reminded that in psychotherapy, uh, it, when people are having some trouble, they may be depressed or going through a relationship problem or something. Very frequently, therapists are uh, are encouraged, or you would say they're, they're tempted maybe at times, to uh, explore childhood. And why is that? Partly because that's where the soul is. Children, family, home. People dream about home so often. I, I listen to dreams uh, every day of my clients. And I have for 40 years. And uh, I often, often hear a dream in which the dreamer finds himself at home or maybe in a home that they used to live in. They don't live in anymore. But the idea is home. That's that's the key. And that's what we look for often in, uh, in our work with the soul and caring for the soul. The home may be not so literal. For example, you, you may want to, you want to be at home at work and the work you do in your life work, to feel at home with your work. Maybe the workplace too to be in the right place, to be doing the right thing. That's also very important to the soul. It's funny, when I say these things, I'm so aware that these, these very points have been made for centuries by people interested in the soul. They make these very same points about home and about work. And the next thing I'm going to mention, which is a little maybe unexpected, is that food is very important to the soul. That's also very close and intimate. And it has a lot of meaning to the soul. Not only the food, the, very, the actual food you eat, and deciding what kind of food you want to eat, but the way you eat and who you eat with. Uh, choosing where in your house to have dinner or breakfast. It's a soul decision. Uh, where to go out for dinner some night to a restaurant. Which restaurant? a soul decision. The word restaurant itself is a soul word because it comes from a word that means restore. You go to a restaurant to restore yourself, not just to get food. It's not just to make sure your body has enough to get along. Going to a restaurant, probably most of the motivation of going to a restaurant has to do with your soul. Who's going with you? Where is it? What 
nationality is the food. All of that is very, very important to eating and dining. So dining and food are very important. When I have clients who are feeling lost, maybe too caught up in their work, things like that, I often suggest that they take some cooking lessons because I think that's a good route to soul through food. So you see that care of the soul can be very concrete. It doesn't have to be abstract. It doesn't have to be psychological in the sense that it's uh, it's invisible or that it's uh, working out your emotions and relationships. It might have something to do with the home you're living in or the food you eat and prepare. So I have, I have really got so much from spending my life talking about the soul and these very ordinary, concrete, interesting things, and also doing therapy with people. Uh, because when you do therapy, you are caring for the soul. In fact, the word psychotherapy, let's look at that for a moment. Psychotherapy. You may know this, but let me mention it anyway. The word psycho is from the Greek word psyche or psyche, which means soul. And therapy is another Greek word that means care or service. These are the two words, that two things that it means. Therapy means care or service. It does not mean to fix, to make better, to cure. Now, you know, people have used the word to mean that, but in its origin, it means care or service. So the word psychotherapy then itself means care of the soul. That's what the words, the parts of that word, psychotherapy, literally mean care of the soul or soul care. Psychotherapy, soul care. Then my idea, and I have developed this idea in one of my recent, recent books called Soul Therapy. Soul Therapy. This book came out just a few years ago. The idea of therapy then, caring for the soul, does not have to be only professional. Like there are psychotherapists, like I do psychotherapy professionally. But psychotherapy as care of the soul can also mean uh, caring for someone's soul in the most ordinary circumstances. So one friend could care for their friend's soul. Let's say someday, or someday a friend of yours calls you up and says, I'm going through a tough time, could we have lunch? That's like saying, life is difficult, I need therapy. In the broad sense of the word, please don't misunderstand me. I don't want to confuse this ordinary, simple notion of therapy with professional therapy. There are two different things, entirely different. Professional therapists is highly trained and should be for dealing with really difficult situations. But in ordinary life, we are also therapists, it seems to me. We are able to be therapists for our friends and for our family members, for our children too. Parents could, could do a better job if they understood that there are moments when they have to be the therapist in the family. Just know that. Not not professional at all, but that right now I have to think and speak therapeutically, meaning I have to care for my children's soul. I have to care for my spouse's soul. That's my job right now, maybe only for five minutes, but I can't just be myself and just speak unconsciously because the therapist is really consciously and carefully trying to speak in such a way that the person's soul is going to be cared for and be better off. So if a child is screaming and really upset, if you scream back at them, not much is going to happen except the continuing pain and uh, struggle. But if you could stop for a minute and say, oh, this moment I have to be the therapist in this situation, 
And so you say to your child, it looks to me like something's really bothering you. And just stop there and see if the child will respond to you. And get somewhere to know what's going on so you know what you're dealing with. Now, it may take a while for a child to stop screaming. That's all right. You can be patient. Be the therapist. I think the same thing holds in, in other situations. For example, I have talked to many people who run their own businesses. And I find when I talk to people in that position that they are very concerned, in my language, very concerned about the soul of their employees. I've, I've seen that over and over again. I'm not saying that every business has that, uh, that, that wonderful uh, opportunity, but I do, I do see that some, some uh, business owners or uh, managers have this concern for their employees and they really want to help them in some way. I see that's, that's what I mean. I think that it's possible for a person in that position, like a manager, to be able to stop and say, if they, if they have this idea in their mind, maybe I should speak therapeutically at the moment. Therapeutically, meaning psychotherapeutically, caring for my, my employee's soul. Like what's going on in the family? My, I've, what I hear sometimes is, my employee is drinking too much. I wish I could help him. Well, you may not be able to help your employee stop drinking. But you could certainly care for that employee's soul and maybe take a step toward a cure by speaking more therapeutically to them, by listening, not having to say so much, not tell them what to do. That's not therapeutic. But not giving advice is not, not, not usually therapeutic. It'd be more important to be able to say words of acceptance, of affirmation, of, uh, and also give them the opportunity to speak. That's a big part of the therapist's job, and to be able to say, um, well, you know, I wouldn't mind taking a few minutes off if you'd like to talk about this, or would you like to say anything more about what's going on? You invite someone to speak, and then you keep quiet, being silent is a big part of being a therapist. You don't you don't talk too much. I mean, you, you talk when you need to, but you also provide a lot of space so that the person can speak. And uh, that's the beginning of something. The dialogue is the beginning of a therapeutic moment. And that can be useful. I'm not saying it's going to solve all problems, but it's therapeutic. It gets things started. It's, you know, it's amazing when you talk to people, how they, they say that I wish someone would just listen to me sometime. And all you have to do then is to step out of that, that uh, role of, of being the, the, uh, the authority or the person who has to make something happen, but to be the listener and the one who can speak in such a way that the person is accepted and has an opportunity to express themselves. Now this leads me to, I wanted to mention several of my recent uh, works to you in this little talk. It leads me to another book that I published recently. This is called The Eloquence of Silence. The Eloquence of Silence. And the subtitle is Surprising Wisdom in Tales of Emptiness. So I'd like to talk about this for a minute. It, it fits right into what I was just saying, of being able to leave, leave a space of silence, because that's a form of emptiness, and silence is one way to be empty. So let me talk about that for a minute. This idea of emptiness might be new to you, I don't know, it may not be. Uh, it's common in Zen Buddhism, in Taoism, and in uh, in India, in the religions of India, and even in Christianity, emptiness appears. Uh, in the East especially, it's a very uh, exalted, uh, highly 
uh, praised and uh, discussed idea. And what it means mostly, it's really hard to say exactly what this means, but it's mostly in the East, it means uh, the no self or not being attached. So not having a self, not always being concerned about yourself or uh, having a lot going on in your mind uh, to be able to relate to the world outside you directly. Uh, here's what I mean. Like maybe you've been you've been in, with somebody, and as they're talking to you, you know that they they have some agenda in mind. They're trying to convince you of something, or uh, they want to feel good. They they're talking to you in such a way they want you to like them, or they want you to think highly of them. You probably I'm sure you you you're aware of this kind of a situation. Now, in the East, the idea of uh, shunyata, they call it, emptiness, might mean to get rid of those thoughts that get in the way of direct communication. You don't have to be thinking to yourself, will they approve of me because of what I'm saying? What if you let that thought go and just talked and not worry about what people thought? Because people can see it on your face when you've got those things going on in your mind. And it does inhibit a direct flow between you and the other person. So that's one way of seeing emptiness. You can see it as just part of life. And it's subtle, subtle, it's not so obvious, but it is something that you can be aware of so that you could say, oh, you know, that's what I'm doing. I'm thinking too much about controlling the situation. What I could do is let go of that thought and I'd have a free conversation with somebody. You can see how this applies then to, I think, to a soulful uh, relationship with someone, that if you can diminish all of those manipulating thoughts, you have a direct relationship, and that is soul to soul, soul to soul. And that, that kind of uh, relationship then has a chance of getting somewhere because it's more real than controlling. And so there's one example of how emptiness might connect to care of the soul. Another way is uh, through silence. I was just saying a few moments ago that that when you're speaking therapeutically to somebody, one aspect of that is to be silent. You're speaking to them, I'm saying, you're speaking to them, but you, you, you know when to be quiet, when to stop speaking, and that will let the other person speak. I noticed that in my therapeutic work. I don't have to say, do you have something to say now? All I have to do is stop talking and show that I'm listening. And then the person has a chance to talk. That's so important. And that could be important in a marriage, say. When, you know, just realizing that and talking to your spouse, your partner, what you uh, need to do more often than you probably think is to give that, to give your partner a chance to express what's going on with them. And that means you be quiet. Silence, the power of silence, and even the eloquence of silence, because that says so much that you can be quiet and listen. And people will hear that, they'll pick up that, that cue that you are now going to listen, that you're going to stop talking. Now what I'd like to do, because this is my most recent book here, The Eloquence of Silence, let me tell you about it first. This book is made up of 30 stories and passages from some of my favorite writers. And following the, the quotation, I just respond. I don't explain, I respond in my own way to what was there, the story or to the, um, to the passage that I chose. I'd like to give an example. 
This is a story called How Many Tigers? It's a traditional story. I think this one comes from the Sufis. Sufis are uh, sometimes called, and there's some, a lot of discussion of exactly who they are, but they're usually called the mystical uh, people, mystical, uh, almost like monastic people within Islam. And they often tell stories as a way to uh, advance in the spiritual life. They do other things too that are may be unusual, like they play music or they dance. You've heard of the whirling dervishes. That's a kind of dancing that they do to achieve a state of mind, a certain state of mind. So they tell stories as well. And many of the stories have this one character in them whose name is Nasruddin. So I'm going to read one of these stories to you. One day, the leader in his village asked Nasruddin to go hunting for tigers. Nasruddin felt he had to go, but he didn't want to. When he returned, his friends asked him, how did it go? Excellent, he said. How many tigers did you kill? None. How many did you encounter? None. How many did you see? None. Why do you say the hunt was excellent if you didn't see even one tiger. When you're hunting tigers, none is plenty. I think you can see there that this is a story about emptiness, nothingness, none, no tigers, none is plenty. I think this story applies to many, many things. And so I'll give you an idea about that. By the way, before I do, I want to mention something else about these stories. Uh, in various countries where emptiness is a value, uh, stories are told or paintings are painted of objects or situations that are literally empty. For example, some might, someone might tell a story about, as they do, an empty pot. They might mention an empty chair. Uh, they might speak of... Uh, an empty field. There's one story I have in here about an empty head, meaning bald, a bald person story. And that baldness is a metaphor or a symbol of emptiness in a much deeper sense. And I think this is something that we can all do, that we can see empty things sometimes and then be reminded of the deeper sense of emptiness. I'll give you a couple examples. One is, the one, one I like is that uh, we all have, have had the experience probably of making arrangements to meet someone at a restaurant. And so you go to the restaurant and you sit there and the person doesn't come, doesn't show up. And you're sitting there staring at the empty chair across from you, or it might be an empty plate at the table. That's what you're looking at. Now, if that were a story by one of these Sufis, they would talk then about emptiness in a deeper way. And I think that's an example for you and for me in those situations, not just to complain or not just to worry about it, but to, for a moment, take the moment to think about emptiness. This is a particular kind of emptiness. Well, the person I expect and depend on is not there. What do I do? How do I respond? Can I relax? Can I be in the presence of that emptiness rather than uh, maybe complain or, or uh, wonder what's going on? It's a very simple situation, but it invites a certain kind of meditation that would be very much in tune with this classic idea of emptiness. Another example of being in a situation like that, uh, someone told me recently that uh, they were just, they just had their camera or their phone in their hand, and they took a picture of uh, outside their house without thinking, just think, taking a picture. And when they had, when they looked at the picture, I almost said when it was developed, I'm an old guy. Uh, when they look at the picture, they saw a bucket that was empty 
that just happened to be in the picture. There was a bucket, empty bucket in the scene, but they had read about emptiness and they thought, oh, here is a photograph of emptiness. I'm going to keep this as one of my images for this deeper kind of emptiness. I thought that was terrific. Now about the tigers, none is plenty. The point I make here, I'll just mention it, is that in the story, maybe the hunt is enough. Maybe going hunting without seeing and without catching anything is is the what's well, one way of looking at it, that the hunt itself is sufficient. You don't have to have achieved the goal. It's a little like the famous poem of uh, Gavafi about Ithaca, the story of the Odyssey, where he tells the story about going to Ithaca, and he, he doesn't get there. And he, he says that it's the journey that's important. It's an, it's an idea a lot of people have mentioned. It's the journey that is important and not the goal. So there's an emptying of goal. I think that can be a very important part of emptying in your life. Emptying the goal. So that means that you you don't have to reach the goal. You may have a goal in mind, but you don't have to get there. You don't have to take it literally. You don't have to be so disappointed if you don't get there. But you might realize, just like Nasr Din, that none is plenty. You don't need it all the time. I tell the story in here about one of my experiences long ago. Uh, I lived as a young man in a Catholic religious order. I was in, in it from to the time when I was 26. And I left. And a few, but it seems to me as a year or two, maybe three years after I left, I was still looking for some a life to live. I didn't, I was kind of lost for a while. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And so I saw an ad, and I, I saw an ad for a writer for a large insurance company. And I thought, well, that'd be good. I can make a little money. And uh, I like writing and I'm good at it. So I think I'll try it. So I went to this uh, the headquarters of this large insurance company. And uh, they asked me to write a sample. So I had to write a training manual of some kind, anything. Uh, I've been a musician uh, for many years. So I wrote a, a, a training manual about uh, playing uh, an organ or a, a pipe organ. And they really liked the manual I wrote. I mean, just a short thing, probably 20 pages. And uh, so I went, I went up to the, uh, to the person who was doing the hiring in the company. And uh, he told me, he said, well, he said, I read what you wrote, and it's really good. But he said, the problem is it's too good. He said, <laughs> He said, you're a real writer, and we don't really want a real writer because you'll be unsatisfied, dissatisfied here doing this job of just writing training manuals. So I'm sorry we can't hire you. Now, that's a pretty good image of emptiness, I think. You know, you think it would, the result would be just the opposite, but you walk away empty. I don't have the job. But another aspect of that story is that if I had got that job, it would have been terrible for me. I what if I were today working, you know, like for an insurance company writing manuals? Not that there's anything wrong in that job at all, but it's not what I would want to have become. And I've I've got to a point now where I've written, you know, thirty books and travel the world for the, talking to people. Who I've read them, and that's a real life for me. It's one I love. I like it very much. I wouldn't have had that had I got the job. So it's a good thing that in that hunt that that hunt for a job i came back and had to say none is plenty i did not get the job and it's a good thing i didn't because the nothing of that adventure was really what uh, what uh, was so important to me and kept me going in my life work so there we go a story about emptiness that i think has a great relevance to to uh, to our lives. You, you could tell a story, I'm sure, that would be similar to that. And I think this relates to soul. I think this, this book on emptiness and this topic of emptiness is related to the soul because 
there's a there's another way to live besides the soul way. You can live more from what my friend James Hillman, the psychologist, used to call the heroic ego, uh, the self as hero, where you have to overcome all difficulties and uh, you know slay dragons and make and win battles in your life. That's the heroic ego. I think it's the the way many many people today live because. There's something about modern life and our modern culture that is based on this idea of the heroic ego, the hero, the ego as hero, the person as hero. You, as we, we talk about that, conquering problems, uh, being on top of things, uh, winning. All of this is the heroic ego. I'm sure the heroic ego is fine at moments and moments, but when it's dominant, when it's the main thing and largely unconscious, it can be a problem. So the alternative to that heroic ego, which keeps the soul out, might be emptiness. It might be giving up that heroism. It might be saying, I don't have to win all the time. And in fact, one of my basic teachings in my work on the soul is that you gain soul very often from losing, from, from losing something important, then you can gain soul. In my case, losing a job opportunity or being fired. I was fired from a university job once, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me, even though it was very difficult for a while. But that's the way it is. You know, the soul gains from very often from loss. It's a, it's a difficult idea for the modern person to grasp because we are so heroic. We want to win all the time. And loss looks like a literal failure. But when you can look back on it, you can see that maybe losing something uh, can be uh, painful usually, but at the same time, it can give you a great deal. So uh, that's how emptiness can relate to uh, care of the soul. I've been very interested in my work on the soul and uh, very interested in the issue of illness and, and uh, healing illnesses, not only emotional illnesses, but physical illness. So over the years, I have... Uh, attended uh, as a lecturer. I've, I've attended many medical conferences and given talks. Usually I'm the last speaker because they want to get all the technical material done early when people are really awake. But then I come in, I give my talk about the person who is sick, sick and the, and the soul of medicine, the soul of, uh, of illness. Going back to Aristotle's idea that the soul is in every part of the body. Not only in every part of the body, but the body itself. So it's my point of view that you, there is no such thing as a human body. We are not only physical. We are never only physical. Because we, are, we have life in us. We have, uh, we, our soul is at work always. And when you go into a doctor's office, you are not just bringing your body to be examined, you are coming with your soul too. Now, usually, the soul is not given much attention. It can be. There are some medical people that are very good at caring for the soul without having to use that language. But very often, they are trained only to see the body and to ignore the soul. And yet the soul is so important in our health and the health of our bodies as well, because these are, these are inseparable. Body and soul are inseparable. And you can't really look at the body without seeing the soul. So what I recommend usually when I visit these medical places, medical centers and conferences for doctors, retreats that doctors are at, what I usually recommend is taking an interest in the, the narrative of the client, of the patient, not just seeing them as a body, but maybe taking a moment to ask about them. 
and ask about their life. You know, all those people lying in hospitals, I know I have visited so many. They have lives, and they have relationships, and they have work, all of which are part of their identity, and therefore part of their illness as well. Maybe not the cause of their illness, but implicated, because that's who they are. I've talked to people in hospitals. I say to them, you know, what, what's it like being here? And they say, well, it's all right. I'm being well taken care of. I think I'm getting better. But people don't see me. They don't see me. They don't ask about me. I have no one to talk to. Then I talk to the doctors and I say, could you possibly relate to the person's soul? And they say, well, we don't have time. There's too much. I'm always in a rush. And I say to them, you know, you could just you could exchange 10 words or five words, and it might make all the difference. I've heard patients say, my doctor smiled at me today for the first time. Really important. A doctor is not just a person. It's a myth. The doc I mean, myth, what I mean by myth is a mythic person, a big person, someone from a great story. The doctor came. That's a big person. And the slightest thing the doctor does is very important, comes across with a lot of strength. That's all dealing with soul. And I think the emptiness is important in, the, uh, uh, in a hospital, let's say, too. I remember uh, one hospital I visited, our whole conversation was about quiet in the hospital. I talked to the patients and they said, this is a nice hospital, but it's too loud. And I said, well, what, what sounds bother you? They said, they told me, they said, nurses in the night slamming their their notebooks or their uh, uh, whatever they are, their, their, their schedules, whatever they're in, there are these hardcover uh, uh, books. They're slamming them in the night and I wake up. If they didn't slam those things, I'd be able to sleep. We need an emptying. We would need an emptying there. What's needed there is not to do something. It's not expensive. It's just a note, uh, a word to the nurses saying, slamming those books that you've got there is uh, keeping people awake. I went to another hospital with a similar issue, and uh, but they told me what they did to solve it was to put carpeting on the floor, not to solve the slamming books, but the, the, problem of quiet. They put carpeting. I know that's expensive and the fancy hospitals can have carpeting, but it does make a difference. I went to another hospital where I was sitting in the room, in a room like a, like a conference room. And we were, it was a beautiful room. I remember it had a, sort of an orange and brown, uh, color scheme. And we were sitting there for a while and the, uh, the uh, nurse who was show me, showing me around said, um, have you noticed that we, we are, what room are in? I said, no, what are we in? She said, this is the imaging room. And they had a huge uh, machine for imaging, like MRI or that kind of machine. And it was built into the wall and it was the same color as the color scheme. And I hadn't even noticed it. This was this is about quieting color, colors that can be quieting and calming. And uh, I said, well, that's interesting that you have this color scheme here and you hardly even see the technology. And I said, uh, how much did it cost you to get that color? And she said, nothing. We just had to ask for it. They had these colors. We got the colors we wanted. So awareness of this kind of thing is awareness of the needs of the soul, the needs of the soul. They're very simple, like in this case, color. I could talk to you about hospital food, but I'd go on and on forever about that because that also relates so much to the soul experience of healing, of being in a place of healing, what kind, what kind of food is served and uh, how it is served. I can't help, I've got to say, just a word about that. 
So I, I, I visited the dining, the, uh, the food service section of, the hosp- of one hospital, very large. I went into this huge room and there were trays, uh, not trays, but uh, yeah, trays on, on carts, big carts, like seven feet tall, uh, one after another. And the trays of these carts were filled with little, uh, little tubs. So I asked them what's in the tubs and they said, this is gelatin. They said, with this gelatin, we can just squirt in any flavor we want. And I said, well, supposing I, I really wanted a banana. They said, sorry, can't give you a banana. We can give you gelatin. I thought, that's, I don't know if this is really the hospital I want to go to. I was in a hospital myself uh, just overnight. And I noticed they had a restaurant style food service where you could, as a patient, you could get on the phone and uh, you had a menu and you could order whatever food you wanted and it would be brought up to you. And I thought, well, that's really nice. It's like being at a hotel and it feels pretty good, better than gelatin. And I went to another hospital from there and I mentioned to them how this hotel style of uh, of food service was really pretty good for me. I felt felt a lot better being there. And they said, well, it's just too expensive. We can't do it. And I'm just thinking, you know, I guess you can usually do do something that you can find the money to do some things. But, you know, it's imagined as being outside the budget, beyond the budget. Because caring for the soul is often put at the end of the list as I'm often put at the end of the speaker's uh, line. So soul is often put last. That's fine. You know, that's the way of the soul, really. Not to be in the forward, not to be up on top. Uh, There's something about the life of the soul that's like that. And that's okay. That's really okay. But I recommend to you, if you want to become a soul therapist in some way, either in your own private life, or professionally, you might keep this kind of this kind of thing in mind that there's an emptiness in the soul, emptying in the sense that you don't have first place. You may not be listened to all the time. Uh, you will be dismissed because of other concerns, money, education, who knows what. You might be dismissed. I remember. Uh, once in, let's see, I was in my 30s and I was teaching at a university, teaching a lot of the things that I write about. And James Holman, my friend uh, and mentor of mine, he was living in the same city and we'd go out quite often off to uh, eat and do some things. And uh, we went out one time and he told me, he said, you know, Tom, he said, you're, you're, you're teaching at this university. I don't think the job is going to last forever for you because soul usually loses, Uh, usually loses. And sure enough, about a year later, the chair of my department called me in and said, um, and I totally unexpected to me, he said, the faculty have decided to not grant you tenure and to ask you to leave. And I thought to myself, uh, well, I understand this, you know, this is this is the life I've chosen. I know this ahead of time. It's going to be a life of losing jobs. <laughs> so uh, Hellman was right. So the chair said to me, do you want to appeal this? This decision could be appealed. And I said to him, no, no, no. I said, uh, you have spoken. You think that it's just you speaking, but fate, an angel, someone has spoken to me that I've got to change my life now. I'm no longer going to be a university professor. I get that. And I'm going to go, it might take me a while, but I'm going to find something else. And sure enough, you know, I I stopped teaching and immediately people began asking me to be their therapist. And fortunately, I had got the training at the university and I started being a therapist. And that led to care of the soul and to my life of uh, speaking to the world about soul of caring for the soul, of trying to imagine a different kind of society, a different culture. 
in which we are not heroic. We are not fighting battles everywhere. We are not finding enemies everywhere. That we'll be wiser and more thoughtful and keep quiet sometimes and listen and watch. That those are all powers of the soul. And emptying, that's a power of the soul. To have some emptiness around, not to have to speak all the time, not to have to fight. When people try to pick a fight with you, to resist by not by not fighting, by doing nothing. Nothingness is a very important word for the soul. So that's that's about where I am and bringing you up to date with me. Uh, that my work and care of the soul continues, although it keeps expanding in different ways, moving into slightly different approaches, different angles of this one same theme. And my last one was emptiness. And I hope that I've been able to show how that applies to all the other work that I've done. And I'll just say a word about my next project. It's just beginning. I live in New England in the United States. And I live about an hour and a half drive from Walden Pond, where Henry David Thoreau made his great retreat for two years, left Concord, which was two miles away, a walk away, an easy walk away, and built a little cabin on the pond. In New England, they call a small, shallow lake a pond. So next to Walden Pond, and, and he really prepared himself for a life of a as a tremendous writer. He was such a beautiful and wonderful writer and had such original thoughts on life. So what I'm doing in my next book is taking passages from Thoreau that I love and respond to them the same way I did in this book on emptiness, not to explain them at all. It's not a book about Thoreau, but a response to Thoreau in my own way, truly having a dialogue with him with my own ideas, my own way of understanding what he was getting at. And I admire him tremendously, so I'm learning from him. But I'm trying to engage him with what I know and my own ideas in my life. So that's my next project, and I'm loving it, I have to tell you, loving it. And uh, I love the writing. I love, uh, I love my work, and that's an important part of the life of the soul to, to for you to find work that you love, if it's at all possible, and to stay on track until you can find that work. And a work especially that can benefit the world that you live in. So it isn't just for yourself and about yourself. So I uh, want to end this uh, this brief talk to you by encouraging you to uh, Resist the society somewhat. You can't care for your soul and be a full, full-time full member of this world we live in. You have to resist it. Go your own way. And make your challenge to live from a deep place as an individual, not participating in the craziness around you to the extent you can avoid it. And create your own life. Let your soul show itself in the work you do, in the way you relate to the to people around you and to your world and to the love you're capable of because the soul and love go together. So I wish that for you and uh, thank you for listening to me. <laughs>